just going to go one more minute and leave that poll up and then we'll take it down and we'll see what some of the results are. Sylvia, Jerry, question. Have you seen a meteor before? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we have. Why do you like astronomy? These are the poll questions in case you're wondering. Oh. And you're asking us now? Yeah. I figured okay. you guys can answer while we wait for everyone else to answer. Well, astronomy is just the most curious thing in the world. It's the most fascinating problem that we have. And it's just such a curious thing for me that it's my favorite thing to do is to look at the sky and wonder what is all of this about? What are we doing on this rock going around the star? We should be worried about this every single day. <laughs> if you like sciences, you should pick a big one. And That's a big don't one. Don't get yeah. much bigger than astronomy. That is true. Are you guys suffering from light pollution where you live? Yes. Yes. And uh, you know, although I take care of my yard and things like that, I did ask my neighbor if he can point his light towards, you know, his part of the yard. And also, he installed a motion sensor, so that was really nice. But then there are other issues that you know, like people's lights for coming from windows or the street lights and so things that we have to live with. Mm. Okay, that's true. Um, okay, so what I'm done now is I'm just gonna end our poll here. Um, it's okay if you're only halfway through. Um, we can always just share it later. Um, so let's see, can you guys see the results here? Ooh, yes. What? All right, so have you seen a meteor before? 61% of the audience have, and 39% haven't, but we're gonna change that. Um, why do you like astronomy? It looks like to look at stars, 39%, followed by feeling a part of the universe. Yes. Uh, let's see what I got, looking at the planets, look at meteors, being outside in it, but of course, all of the above is the highest polled answer there. Mm -hmm. And are you suffering with light pollution where you live? 81% um, of our audience are suffering from light pollution. Yes. Interesting. All right. So I'm just going to get rid of that. I've got a clear screen now. Everybody can see. Yeah, it looks good from All here. All right. Well, let's get started then. So hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Park After Dark webinar. My name is Jennifer and I am the park interpreter in Spruce Woods Provincial Park, which resides on Treaty One territory, home of the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and the Métis Nation. So over the course of this webinar, if you have any questions, uh, questions, sorry, please type them in the Q&A box, which will be down below. And what we'll do is we will strive to answer as many as we can throughout uh, the program. Um, if you can't get them into the Q&A box, you can pop them in the chat as well, because I will be monitoring that uh, during the presentation as well. So uh, us here in Manitoba Parks, we are committed to promoting a healthy dark sky by reducing light pollution and by providing stargazing opportunities in provincial parks. So over this winter season, we are going to be offering a series of webinars with our wonderful partners at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And today we are joined with two of my good friends, Sylvia Graca and Jerry Smirchansky. And we are here to discover all about the Geminids Meteor Shower. So without much further ado, why don't you guys, I feel like I want to applause you on, uh, come on in and show us your wonderful presentation. Okay. Um, the poll that we just had, I found to be incredibly disturbing. I can't believe this many people have not seen a meteor. I would have said that if you hadn't seen one by now, you've got to get out more. This is very disturbing to see that so many people have not seen a meteor yet. But as Jennifer said, hopefully we'll change all that in the next few days. So what are meteors? As the uh, little caption at the bottom of the screen reads, a meteor should be thought of more as an event than as a thing. And we'll get into that in a bit, but it is an encounter between something from space with the planet Earth. And it's a very brief encounter that at least is visible to us at night. The one great thing about uh, 
observing meteors is that you don't need a lot of scientific equipment. You can get away with just your eyeballs and a comfy chair for the most part, and maybe something to help you record your observations. In so much of astronomy, you need specialty equipment. You need to be able to view very tiny specific parts of the sky. With observing meteors, it's all wide open. The whole sky is there for you to look at and legitimately so to find things. And you don't need anything special in the way of equipment. Your best equipment for looking at meteors is with your own eyes. Now we got to do a little tidying up of uh, some terms here before we start. As I said, meteors should be best thought of as an event. It is the intersection, the interaction of rocks in space called meteoroids. Now meteoroids can be anything from microscopic particles on up to anything about a meter in size. If it's larger than a meter in size, we refer to those as asteroids. So we've got an arbitrary distinction going on there. So we have these rocks in space that once they encounter the Earth's atmosphere, the, uh, well, they used to like talking about saying it's the friction of the event. Well, it's the interaction, the compression in the atmosphere. It's the interaction of the rock with the materials that causes it to heat up and glow in the night sky as it streaks through our sky. These things are going through our sky very quickly. Now, in addition to regular streaks of light, I mean, sometimes called shooting stars, there's other special types of events that happen. Uh, one of them is called a fireball. Now, this is arbitrarily defined as a really bright meteor, something brighter than Venus, something that might throw off sparks, something that might even make sounds in some cases. But that last bit is usually reserved for this term here, bolides, bigger rocks that actually explode in our skies in some ways. We just had uh, one of these happen on uh, December 2nd over Lake Ontario. People in Ontario and in New York State uh, witnessed a bolide that streaked through their sky at noon hour. They saw this in the sky at noon in, in bright daylight and it streaked across their sky, ending with a big explosion that was heard in parts of uh, southwestern Ontario and uh, New York State. Now, if you do have something large enough that can penetrate in a particular way so that there's bits of it left over that aren't just blown all to smithereens like most of this stuff is, you can get some pieces of these space rocks that fall to Earth. Those are called meteorites. So meteoroids are everything that's in space. Meteors are the event of it burning up through our atmosphere. And if anything's left over, it falls to Earth. It's called a meteorite. Now, one thing that uh, is special to our purposes here is observing meteor showers. Now, meteor showers are time-sensitive events. They occur in particular time periods in which meteors are observed to come from one part of the sky. They seem to radiate out from one particular part of the sky. And that's due to the fact that the Earth is encountering old streams of materials from comets and asteroids. Now, the meteor showers are generated by these streams of little bits and pieces, dust and whatever that has come off of the comets and asteroids. So if you know where the orbits are of these uh, asteroids and comets, and you know we're gonna pass through them, you're able to predict these events. Now, the interesting thing is we knew about a lot of these events before we knew what was even causing them. So the story I've just told is sort of backwards for what we get out of our, the historical account. So here's the general scheme of what a meteor shower is about. 
you're going to have what we call a radiant point. Now, the radiant point is where the meteors will appear to come from. They don't all start here. You won't always see it start here. You might just see it streak across this part of the sky, or you might see it streak down across this part of the sky. But if you were to trace back the whole journey, even to where it was in the dark, you'd find that they all seem to radiate out of one point in the sky. Now, the best way to think about this is to think about something that we should all be able to relate to, uh, snow falling. Let's say you have very light, fluffy snow and it's barely falling to the ground. Now, if you're standing still, this snow will seem to drift around sort of randomly and not have any real direction to it. However, if you're in an automobile moving through this snow that's just sort of randomly floating around, you will start to see that it appears as if the snow uh, flakes are all coming from one part of the sky. They will all appear to come from a particular point. Now, add to that scene the idea that there's a wind coming. So if you're in a car and there's no wind and the snow is just sort of drifting around, the radiant point should seem to come from straight ahead of you as your car is moving. If the wind is blowing from the left-hand side of your view, what's going to happen is that radiant point will move in that direction because the snow, in some sense, is coming at you from your left-hand side. So the radiant point is going to move depending on your motion and the motion of the stream of particles that is, in, is into encountering the Earth. Now this example here is from a very familiar shower, the Perseids, that occurs in uh, August. And this is one where it just gives you these examples of how you can look in various directions to see different uh, meteors at different times. Now, here is a list of fairly regular meteor showers. We put the one of interest tonight at the top of the list, even though it's the last of the year. But the Geminids this year is going to be quite good, mainly because we don't have a moon to uh, wash out the, the faint ones. And we have a situation where the materials that are going to come at us this year are going to be seen in fairly clear skies, hopefully. We'll get to talk a little bit more about that too. Uh, the other showers that you can get throughout the year, see the different dates for some of these things. There's no particular time of year that's necessarily better than any others. And these are just the main regular showers. There's hundreds of minor showers that we're still trying to sort out and the define in certain ways. So there's always room for lots of citizen science to go on here to help us determine what some of those more minor showers might be. If you look over here, you'll see this woodcut, this picture from 1863? Yeah, say 1863. And this shows a real shower type thing with meteors all over the place here. Now that was an event that took place in November of uh, 1863, it was the Leonid meteor shower, which about every 30, 33 years puts on a real wicked display where you can sometimes, if the year is right, you will see it look like it's raining stars. Uh, the last good appearance of the Leonids was 2001, 2002, something around there. It was an excellent uh, showing of it in uh, 1999 as well. So it's not a, always a for sure thing. What you need to know is, is the Earth going through certain particular old orbital paths of, a, of the comet that you're trying to uh, determine its orbit so that you can figure out if the Earth is going to pass through something that's going to give you these huge displays. 
And of course, what you're looking for in some cases is you want to see where the, the comet is maybe made a fresh orbit close to you so that you're going through the fresh materials. So it'll be a much more concentrated display of things because this stuff spreads out over time. Now the object of tonight we're talking about here is the Geminid meteor shower. So first of all, take a look at this little chart. So you're, we're looking east here after sunset, maybe closer to something like eight o'clock. So this is like three hours after our sunsets at this time of year. And here is the constellation Gemini. It's over on its side here. It's the bright star, Paul, the bright star, Castor. Up over here is the constellation Orion. So this should help orient you to see how you should try and find the constellation Gemini. The bright star Procyon is also underneath it here. And if you're if it's late enough, Sirius will also be up. So this can give you some orientation as to how these things get laid out. Up over here someplace would be the Pleiades and, and Taurus. So that might help you get your bearings as well. But just looking east at about maybe eight, nine o'clock, you, you should see these this configuration of stars. And we've drawn in a few sort of fake meteors here just to give you a sense of where the radiant point is. Radiant point will be right here above Castor. So the, the meteors will appear to have come out of that part of the sky. Now, the Geminid meteor shower is not only notable for it becoming on a new moon, so a nice dark sky this year and hopefully a clear sky, but what we need to uh, also talk about is the way in which the Geminid meteor shower is a little different than most of the others. Almost all the other meteor showers we know of, they come from uh, debris left by comets. Not so with the Geminids. The Geminids are due to debris left by uh, asteroid. And the Geminids actually look different than other meteor showers too. If you've seen a few meteor showers in the past, you'd realize that the Geminids are bright, they're colorful, they're sometimes a little slower than some of the others, especially the early evening ones can take a long time to travel across the sky. And I remember as a kid sitting out there with a snowmobile helmet on, which almost restricted my vision, looking up to see the, the Geminid meteors and realized that I needed to take the helmet off to get a better view of these things. But even though it's at the cold time of year, this is a really great shower to take in. It's been quite reliable for about 200 years now because uh, in the past, it wasn't a very notable shower, but for the last 200 years or so, it's been pretty good about 250 years maybe that it's been noted as being a fairly reliable shower. Jerry, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, so James Fast is wondering, is there typically more meteor shower activity closer to the radiant or not necessarily? Ah, well, we'll talk a lot about that. I've got a very expert analysis way of watching meteor showers that almost results in me seeing less meteors than everybody else. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit too. But yeah, the, the radiant point is not necessarily where you want to be looking, and especially early in the evening. And we're going to get into that when we talk about the, the, the earth grazing meteors that are going to happen early on in the evening, and then what's going to happen later on. Because remember what's going to happen over the course of the night. Right now, the radiant, I mean, Gemini would have risen from someplace over here, and it's swinging up through our sky. By about two in the morning, Gemini is going to be high overhead. So in the early evening, all the meteors that would be falling down here, those you won't see these in the early part of the evening. You'll only see the ones that are flying up and above. So with the radiant lower in your sky, you're not going to see as many meteors to begin with. So looking at the radiant is not necessarily a good thing, especially early on in the evening. 
later on at night when it gets higher overhead, not only should you see more because more of the sky around the radiant will be visible to you, but they won't be cut off due to the horizon here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the things, see the, the first question that comes up is like, how many, when are you going to see the biggest number of them? Now, in everything having to do with uh, observing meteors, there's something called the ZHR, the Zeniathal Hourly Rate. This is the, the biggest most important factor for some people, and yet it is one of the most horrible misrepresentations of what you're going to see. It, uh, the zeniathal hourly rate talks about how many meteors you're going to see, and every report you're going to see is going to come out saying, oh yeah, you'll see 100 an hour, or you'll see 50 an hour, or whatever. Because what they're doing is they're quoting you that ZHR number. Now, the ZHR number is calculated when the ZHR, the zenithal point, is right overhead, which for most of the night, it's not. And it assumes incredibly dark skies, skies where you can see stars that are 6.5 in magnitude. Now that's very dim. Most people have never seen skies that dark. So, there's several factors that are telling against you ever seeing as much as the ZHR claims you're going to see. Oh, and the other thing that it also includes, you have to be able to look at all the sky at once. And usually that requires two or three different observers rather than just one person flat on their back with some zoomy eyeballs or something like that that are able to see the entire sky. So, don't set too much store by the, the ZHR, the Zeniathal hourly rate is nothing that you really need to get too concerned about. It just helps to know when it's going to be at its highest. Don't worry too much about the actual number of it. I have another question for you, Jerry, from Skylar. Sure. Um, they are just wondering in general if um, what we're seeing, um, can meteors be trashed from rockets? Can be. Can meteors be trashed from rockets? Oh, there, there is sometimes uh, mistaken meteors. Sometimes uh, space junk re-enters Earth, and it can be mistaken for a, a meteor. Uh, there's a couple of telling factors that helps you distinguish meteors from space junk re-entering Earth. Uh, space junk re-entering Earth is moving much slower than most meteors. And space junk, if it's big enough to light up enough so that you can see it, is usually going to have a slightly different look to it. It's going to look much more fiery. It's going to look more as if it is a piece of material that is just crashing to Earth with almost what looks like flames to it. But yeah, space junk and, and stuff returning from, from orbit can have that look. Space capsules, for instance, can have that look. The biggest difference is speed. Uh, one of the other big differences is a lot of meteors, showers especially, that we like to watch are going to be found, like in this case, where we're looking east. Yeah, over the course of the night, yes, it's going to rise higher in our sky and we'll maybe look south or north or whatever. But what's going to happen here is that the uh, space junk almost always will be moving from west to east. Sometimes in a north or southerly component, but for the most part, it'll be coming out of the west somehow. And we don't get an awful lot of meteors coming at us that way. And... We'll explain a little bit more about that later, too. And they're usually a, quite a bit more brighter, too. Yes, yeah, space junk when it's coming down, because it's bigger. Right. Yeah, it's, and it'll have that, like, it, it looks like something crashing in.
Now, to give you a little bit more understanding of what you're looking at when you're looking at a meteor, here's some results that people have measured for the Geminids. For one thing, I was just telling you about the speed at which they're coming at us here. To go through a little bit more about how some of this speed gets added up to at this point. But as you can see, they're coming in really hot, pretty fast. And atmosphere, for the most part, we don't think of it as extending this high up, but this is up to about 100 kilometers up when we first start to see them. So all these white dots here is the altitude at which a meteor from the Geminids was first spotted and they were able to calculate its atmosphere or uh, at its altitude. And that's usually done through triangulation. Now, these orange dots, yellowy orange dots, are the altitudes at which it burned out and was no longer visible. So as you can see, they get down to about 20 kilometers in height or 20, 25 miles. So yeah, they're almost 40 kilometers. So these things are a lot higher up than you think they are. And when you see bright meteors, I mean, uh, Scott Young used to get me to investigate the meteor, uh, the big meteor findings up in the interlake. I know I went with Ralph a few times and with uh, Brian Renault and a few other Rascal members investing, investigating meteorites or meteors with the possibility of meteorites. And we went and interviewed people who saw the, the bolide, for instance. And so many of them would say, oh, it was so close. You know, it just fell over in Joe's field over there. And it's, you know, it can't be that far. I did one interview in Stonewall once and they said, it can't be any further away than Lake Winnipeg that had to fall in the lake or whatever. So everyone gets this impression they know how far away these things are and they don't. They don't really have a clue as to how far away these are. For instance, we were able to plot the one that the Stonewall observers saw that they thought plunked into Lake Winnipeg about 10 miles away. No, actually that fireball was flying straight up the Manitoba, Ontario border. So not 10 miles away, but more like 110 miles away, much further away than they would have ever expected. The other thing about Geminid meteors is, as I said, they come from a special object. They come from the asteroid known as Phaeton. It's um, a Earth crossing orbit uh, of an um, asteroid. And it's rather large by the standards of anything that gets close to us. It's about five, almost six kilometers in diameter. And it has a very eccentric orbit, which means it goes quite far out from the sun and then gets quite close to the sun, very much like a comet would. And we'll show you its orbit in a little bit. But with Phaeton, it gets incredibly close to the sun. It's the Ob it's the only, it is the closest, it's the object that's closest to the sun that has a proper name to it. I mean, there's a few other things that get closer, but they usually don't last. Phaeton gets within, you know, a few tens of millions of kilometers of the sun. Its surface rises to the temperature of over 800 degrees Celsius. So metals and certain rock types are going to start melting on its surface. So this is no wimpy, dirty snowball of a comet. This is really a tough, hardened, melted, remelted object that has been going around the sun for billions of years, most likely. Anyways, this object here, because of its peculiar nature, it's rocky, it's metallic. We know a few things about it because we've actually had a few uh, early shots of looking at it because it's um, it's known as a, an Apollo asteroid, which is a group of asteroids that cross Earth's orbit but are just found not too far away from Earth. They're inside of Earth, 
just uh, out as far maybe as Mars's orbit, but they don't quite go all the way out to the asteroid belt, for instance. And here is a little animation showing the path of Phaeton here. For one thing, if you notice all these little bars, these little lines underneath it, that's to tell you that it's above the plane of the solar system. The solar system can be modeled pretty much on a tabletop. All the planets can be shown pretty much modeled accurately if you plunk them all on a tabletop. They're all orbiting in that same plane. The asteroids and comets, they don't follow those rules. And they can come in from strange, crazy angles all the time. And let this animation just start one more time as it comes around. This blue line is the Earth. And you'll notice as it comes together right there, right in this spot here, you have a, a quick intersection. And that uh, the, the path that uh, had this intersection uh, occurred a few years ago in 2017. Matter of fact, it was late, it was December 2017, which should have made it for a really good uh, meteor display that year. But uh, as far as I remember, it was cloudy. A full moon? I'm not sure if it was a full moon or not then, but I'm trying to rem remember the details of 2017. I just know that we were kind of disappointed, at least I was, in that. And notice how close Phaeton gets in here close to the sun, much closer to it than the planet Mercury. But it flies through this part of the area quite quickly because it's following uh, Kepler's laws of uh, motion here. So when it's close to the sun, it speeds up. When it's out at the end of its orbit, it's slow, slow, slow. It spends most of the time, comes roaring in quickly around the sun, then back out again. But in that time, it heats right up. And they think the surface of, uh, of Phaeton is probably desiccated uh, rocky metallic material. So think of a dried out salt flats or mud flats with cracks and things and, and bits of material that gets melted and remelted with each pass. And its orbit, it goes through that orbit uh, in about 1.4 years. So it's had a lot of passes past the sun where it's been heated up and then cooled down again over you know, millions, billions of years of doing this. So this is one tough little nut of a asteroid these days, and yet it's still shedding material and getting that hot and re-energizing its orbit of, with material that way. It's not surprising that it can give us this very, uh, distinctive display. And especially when you see some of the colored displays, you're gonna see more colors in Geminid meteors than any of the other meteor showers. So you're gonna see red ones, you're gonna see bluish green ones, and you can even see some very weird looking yellow ones with sparks to them sometimes. It can be quite entertaining. Now, when we talk about meteor showers in general, here is a, sort of chart of the inside solar system. So everything you see with white dots here, or not so much these green dots or the orange dots, but a lot of these things out here with the white dots, some of these have the potential to also generate uh, meteor uh, showers as well. Here's the orbit of Mars out here. So we're talking about the asteroid belt here, all through here. And here's Earth in here, Venus's orbit, Mercury, and then inside is the sun. So you have a situation where you can have the Apollo asteroids, all of them would come out to maybe the edge of the asteroid belt, and then would cross in over Earth's orbit in some ways, and Earth's orbit's here. So if it's an Earth-crossing orbit, otherwise known as a potentially hazardous asteroid, uh, it can give you uh, potential for a minor shower. And now let's just move on a bit to this idea of, okay, you've seen a bright meteor and you want to tell someone about it. 
Well, the first thing to do would be to maybe, you know, if you're a member of the RASC, you would uh, put something on our email list, ask if anyone else had seen it. But if it's something big, something bright that you think really needs to uh, have serious people pay attention to it, there is the American Meteor, Meteor Society, not Meteorological Society. That's a totally different group. They're concerned with weather. The American Meteor Society collects reports on this from around the world that allows you to uh, compile information so that you can do things like to track some of the uh, incoming paths on these things. And that's probably their most important uh, mandate, their, their most important way of uh, collecting data and doing things is to try and plot the, the origins of the material that we see coming in for meteor showers, even some of the minor ones. I'm just gonna back up a bit here too. Okay, here's the geminid meteor shower. It's been quite good. It's been relatively reliable for 250 years. For most of that time, we never knew what the parent body was, the, the thing that generated the bits and pieces. We had no idea that Phaeton existed. Phaeton was discovered in 1983. And once its orbit was plotted, well, and it was discovered by a satellite, by the way, which is an unusual thing. Anyways, once we plotted its orbit, it was recognized, uh, hey, we know this orbit. That's the orbit of the Geminid materials that we see coming in all the time. Eureka, we have found the source of the Geminid meteors. So these meteor showers are indicative of pathways that get near us, that cross our orbit. And for that reason, they're really important. Uh, mentioned earlier that in January, there's the Quadrantids meteor shower, which is up by the handle of the Big Dipper, up close to an extinct uh, constellation called Quadrant. But we've been observing this meteor shower for much longer, and we didn't have a clue what the source material for the Quadrantids was until 2003, when we finally discovered the source for the Quadrantid meteors. And because these things cross our orbit, it's kind of important for us to know what it is, how big it is, and where it's going. So this is all part of a huge effort by all of humanity here to know what's out there and to know what might come and smack us someday. So for that reason, we're going to try and encourage everybody to keep looking up, document as much of this as you can, because who knows, might save our butt someday. Okay, so, and now it's my turn. All you need to know to observe the Gemini. So you don't need a telescope, you don't need binoculars. All you need is your eyes, that's all you need. And you need to know when to be out there, which is actually Sunday night and Monday morning. And the, the actual Gemini shower started, I think, December 4th, and it goes until the 17th. But it's important to go on Sunday and Monday because the Earth is going to be traveling through that path of debris that Jerry's been talking about. And that's when you're going to see the most uh, meteors. Sylvia, on Sunday evening, earlier in the evening, you might have a chance to see this more rare type of geminid, which is called an Earth Gracer uh, meteor. And what it does is it goes across a long and horizontal in the sky. And I think Jerry wants to show now. Yeah, we, we, we've got a prop here for this. And we'll see how this is going to work. Here is our Earth. And great. The observer, the observer has been knocked off the Earth. I found the observer. OK, put the observer so we'll back. So put him in North America? Right. But he has to face the eastern sky. OK. This is high tech. Yeah, this is, well, and this is the best tech for this, too, because even two-dimensional stuff on screens doesn't always get the point across. So this is the Earth. It is smoking along in its orbit at about a little over 100,000 kilometers an hour. So there's your car traveling through the snowstorm. And 
the which I happen to locate in Winnipeg at this point here, is going to start out the evening where the sun has just set behind him. He's looking in the eastern sky, but too early in the evening, if, I, if this is the path of the Geminids coming in too early in the evening, the meteors are all going to be just hitting on this side of the planet. This side will be in darkness. So Africa, Europe will be seeing Gemini high overhead, the radiant, the, and it'll look like they're just falling down into the planet. So short little pathways. Now, the Winnipeg observer at this point, once it's dark and Gemini is, you know, just at the horizon or above, some of those meteors are going to be flying along just like this. And yes, this scale is exaggerated. This wouldn't quite be the way it would work. But as you can see, high overhead of the Manitoba observer, you're going to see these long ones that are just grazing through our atmosphere and aren't burning down deep into the thick atmosphere where they burn up quicker. So these things can streak a long ways through the very thin air and in some cases even skip back out into space. So those are what we call the earth grazers. And over time, like as the earth keeps rotating, what's going to happen is the observer is going to be in a position where he actually sees the radiant point much higher in his sky, and he gets to see more of the meteors that are falling down. And then morning comes, and hopefully he goes to sleep. All right, so that, those are type of meteors, so they're a little bit more rare. And so you have to be really lucky to see one that will do that. And the next thing that you need to know is where to look. So don't worry about the radiant point because the meteors are actually going to appear across the whole sky. So don't be looking for the radiant point and, and, and stare at that point because they can actually pop up throughout the sky. And uh, so what you want to do is have as much sky as you possibly can. So you can travel out to a country road, maybe a farmer's field, or even in your own backyard, as long as it's not obstructed by too many things like big trees or buildings and things like that, that's actually uh, good enough. Okay, uh, the other part about where to look is, like Sylvia said, meteors are like gold. They're where you find them. The general strategy is early in the evening, you've got much better chance of looking at the uh, earth grazers. And I know some veteran uh, meteor observers like Jay Anderson and such, they like to actually look away from the radiant because they want to see those long streaks that just might be hitting the atmosphere high above. Maybe later on during the night, they'll start looking towards the radiant, but very few people actually look right at the radiant. They may just have that out of the corner of their eye. The general strategy that uh, should yield you the most is to keep the radiant sort of just off your left-hand corner of your eye and watch to the east and upward as much as possible. And as the evening goes on, you follow the radiant point so that you always keep it in the corner of your eye and move towards the south. Now, I follow this strategy, and I don't see as much in the way of meteors as other people. So Sylvia's advice, she's, she's the meteor queen. She sees more than anybody. Apparently, I see them. Because Jerry will be looking through a telescope, and I'll be like, hey, look at that. But by then, he's already missed it. So, yeah, they're quick. It's his own fault. OK, the next thing that you need is also dark skies. So you can see in this uh, photograph here of the same house. This one house has the light on in the backyard. And look at how it washes out all of the stars. You turn off the light, and you have many more stars. And that's what you want, because you want the meteors to be nice and bold and bright in a dark sky. This house could have actually done even better by putting some blinds here, because any light that leaks out actually takes away from, from the dark sky. Oh, and th there's a lot of very faint meteors that get added into mm -hmm. that, that ZHR rating, and you'll miss those for sure if your sky is too bright. You'll only see the bright ones. 
Yeah, and it's all about light pollution. And as 80% of the people on this call tonight said, they suffer from light pollution. And if you ever wanted to do something for the environment, but it seemed too overwhelming because some of these pollution problems are so complex, right? Light pollution is actually one of the easy, easy ones that anyone can take on. So for example, make sure that you shut your lights off when you're not using them or draw the blinds like we showed on that house. Or if you need lights in your driveway for security, for example, install a um, motion sensor so that the light is not turned on all the time. Another quick thing that we can do is put a shield on the light so it doesn't spill up into, into uh, space and it actually illuminates what needs to be illuminated. So it's so easy to actually uh, take care of something like light pollution if we all actually do it. Look at the city here. See how their lights are all pointing down? And you can see that many stars if only there was no light pollution. So review of what you need in order to see these meteors. So Sunday night to Monday morning, find an open sky and get away from light. Another thing is to get nice and comfy and to be patient. This guy has it right, I think. He's got this nice lounger with a blanket. He's wearing a toque and knit, except he's laying in the middle of a road. Maybe that shouldn't be, <laughs> that's not probably right. But uh, this is the way to do it. And uh, be patient because it actually, takes time for your eyes to get dark adapted. So once you head out into the darkness, your pupils will dilate really quickly, but your eyes need to go through this photochemical process. And that process can actually take 15 to 20 minutes. So you wanna make sure that you're dark adapted because you will be able to pick up even more meteors. You can also keep track of the meteors by counting them so you can, Note the time when you start actually observing and the time when you ended observing and how many you have per count. You can share that with us on Facebook. We love to hear how many meteors different people were able to see. And uh, you can also be um, a citizen scientist, for example, by reporting this to spaceweather.com or the website that Jerry mentioned, which was the American Meteor, Meteor Society. Meteor Society. Another thing you can do that won't help you with watching, but it's pretty um, cool to contemplate is what is this object? It's even mysterious to scientists because most meteor showers, as Jerry mentioned, are caused by comets. And comets are these icy bodies that are fragile and loose debris all over the place. And that's what makes it, you know, all this debris crashing into the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, a lot of volatile material on a comet. Right. But meteor or uh, asteroids are usually hard rocky things that don't really lose that much stuff so there's a lot of um, uh, hypotheses about what is causing this asteroid to actually cause such a beautiful meteor shower could it be that it's a dormant comet or maybe it's a dead comet or maybe something smashed into it and the pieces of it are loose and and causing a, a, a trail of debris Every time we don't know about something, we postulate another collision. <laughs> Much more likely to me anyways, is the idea that this thing gets near the sun and it probably gets turned into a jippy pop popcorn machine that can throw material out and, and such. They've done some calculations though, and they say they've been able to figure out how much stuff an asteroid should shed even that close to the sun. And apparently it doesn't even come close to accounting for how much material we see on the average uh, Geminid meteor shower. So yeah, the mystery still remains. Okay, and if you want more of this astronomy stuff in your life, all you need to do is join the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the RASC, which has a chapter here in Winnipeg. and. Uh, Everybody is welcome. You don't need to have any prerequisites. Beginners are welcome. And uh, actually a lot of us were beginners at some point. And here we have, uh, for example, Ralph Browning. He is one of the RASC Winnipeg members who is a meteorite expert. And he has this meteorite pit in Sioux. And before the COVID-19 restrictions and everything, we actually he would actually hold these uh, petting Sioux sessions where the public and us, we can go and take a look at his vast collection of meteorites and uh, 
Ralph is very knowledgeable on that. He's even written a book. So if you wanted to know more about Meteorite, you can find this book online and uh, purchase it from Amazon and various others, I believe. And then we can hook you up with the author if you have any more questions. That's right. We also contact Ralph when we find a rock that's really peculiar and we wonder, oh, this is heavy and it looks odd. I wonder if it's a meteorite. So we'll ask Ralph, is this a meteorite? And he'll usually say, oh, that looks like a meteor wrong. But uh, sometimes it does turn out that, you know, you find something that's, uh, that is a meteorite. Another thing the club does is uh, we hold star parties for the public and for the members at Spruce Woods Park, which is, the uh, park that uh, Jennifer Bryson hosting this session tonight is the interpreter for. And we go to Spruce Woods Park because it has one of the most pristine dark skies in the province of Manitoba. So we really like going out there. And this picture was actually taken by one of our members, Sheila Wishar. And it was a meteor that uh, was so bright that it illuminated the park for, a, for several seconds it made a noise and uh, it even left a trail of, of smoke behind and Sheila happened to be pointing at the right place at the right time to capture this picture. There is also members that do sketching and uh, just in August of this year during the Perseids meteor shower, which was actually quite good and we saw quite a, a number of them, we got together at the uh, Glenlee Observatory and this is a sketch of the uh, constellation of Boethes with the Perseid meteor going just above the uh, telescope dome. We also have a community of astrophotographers from all levels of expertise. So we have beginners and we have really uh, experts and, and these are actually photos from some of our members. And just before we uh, end off on our talk about meteors, we have to make this special announcement about what they're calling the Christmas star of 2020. This is the alignment of the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, this, as you can see from this uh, chart, if you look low in the southwest skies just after sunset, you will see for the next you know, 10 days or so, Jupiter will be slowly approaching, getting closer and closer to Saturn until they will appear to the naked eye to almost merge into one very bright star. And afterwards, Jupiter will continue on moving past Saturn at this point. Now, this alignment of Jupiter and Saturn being visible to us, there's, there was one not that long ago, but there was the last one that was visible like this occurred 800 years ago. So this is rather kind of a special event. And on the 16th, I mean, we've got the moon here on the 21st. So this is the, the closest approach on December 21st. But don't wait till then to start watching this. Start locating them tonight, tomorrow night, as soon as you've got clear skies to the I'm southwest. Sure. And you will see them getting closer and closer and closer to each other. And Jupiter is the one moving a bit faster because it's closest to us. But on the 16th, I mean, this is already too low down here, but on the 16th, the moon will be located down here just below Jupiter and Saturn. So catch it a little earlier in the evening. And on the 17th, the moon will be up on this side of Jupiter and Saturn. So you've got an incredible traffic jam of and combination of Kodak moments, photographic moments here to take a look at for the next 10 days or so, having to do with a few other planets and our moon. Okay, and, and that concludes the presentation. And just to let you know, again, if you wanted to join uh, our club or just to know what we're up to, if we have any public events, here's our website, www.winnipeg.rasc ca you can make contact uh, to us right through there and to report meteors or talk to us or join the club so great well thank you so much sylvia and jerry um there's also the brandon and area astronomical Soci society as well um, mm -hmm. interested in joining them um trevor i believe is here trevor would you mind putting your link in the chat for anyone as well that would be great 
Um, we do have some questions for you guys. So you guys ready for some? We have sure. a few. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first one was actually a joke, which I thought was funny from David Samard, who said, why do space rocks taste better than earth rocks? Uh, don't know. They're meteor. Uh, <laughs> oh. So I thought it was a good one. See, the um, Parians are going to be mad at that. <laughs> so we do have, um, how do they ensure the space station avoids the meteoroids? Ah, it, it is. Uh, it can't, really. It's not anywhere near uh, maneuverable enough for that. And because these rocks are notoriously hard to predict, it just has to take the hits. So far, it and it has been hit by some very tiny ones, like this, the size of grains of sand have hit it. If you get something the size of a baseball or something, it would probably rip right through the station. And there's no real way they can see it coming or do anything about it. It's a very big, heavy object. It can be moved to avoid satellites because we know of their particular orbit. And so we know how to move the International Space Station to avoid getting too close to a satellite. And what we do at the time is we stick the astronauts in their escape modules and leave them there. But I'm afraid when it comes to meteors, if they think it's gonna be a particularly nasty shower, for instance, when uh, Phaeton came around in 2017 and they realized, oh, it's gonna be pretty close to us and it might be shedding some fresh, bigger chunks. You might feel a blight say, oh yeah, you know what? For a few hours while we pass through the peak here, why don't you guys all get into the escape capsules now and just wait it out for a few hours? They could do that sort of thing, but other than that, no, they're at the mercy of the random chance of the cosmos. And where space junk is even a bigger threat. Yeah, by the far, meteors, by yeah. far, space junk is a much bigger threat for them than, than the meteors. Because um, remember, most of the stuff's very small. Most of the little pieces you see flying across the sky are the size of a grain of sand. If it looks enough sparks and you know it's getting a nice trail to it, it might be as big as a marble or maybe a golf ball in size, but that's about it for most of the pieces you see. Now that chunk that flew by Ontario the other day and the Chelyabinsk, um, meteor, which was meteorite because it hit the ground in many cases. Yeah, that was a much bigger chunk of rock. And again, we had no way of knowing that that chunk was coming. So we're at the mercy of this. Um, Skylar is also wondering, can two meteors crash and make fireballs? Hmm. Uh, an interesting thing. Uh, when, when you first said the question, I interpreted it wrong. It's like, uh, can a meteor cause a fire? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think you must, do they it's, collide? Do they right. collide with each other? It's, it's possible for things to collide, but boy, the odds are, and pardon the pun, astronomical <laughs> against that kind of situation. Uh, there has been some cases of, of meteorites uh, being found immediately as they fell. It was, I think, a house in New Zealand or Australia. I'm not sure which now. But uh, it crashed through this uh, retired woman's uh, roof and bounced around her living room and smashed her television set when it hit the ground. <laughs> and people said, well, you know, was it super hot? Well, no, actually the interior of the meteor is really quite cold. It's been at, you know, frigid inter, uh, inter solar uh temperatures, so it'd be like, you know, minus, you know, 170 something degrees Celsius or whatever. And yeah, it briefly went through the atmosphere that charred and burned the surface of it. But yeah, it, it itself wasn't very warm. You could pick it up right away afterwards and not worrying about it being too hot to handle like you see in so many of the Hollywood movies that they give it. There was another one that hit a taxi in Chicago and punched through his trunk. I, I think he got a new uh, taxi out of the deal. Or something. <laughs> so we've had a few questions. Um, a couple of them wondering, are, can they see the meteor shower? Wow. Can they see the meteor shower like tonight? If they go outside tonight, will they be able to see? Yes. 
Yeah, so, and got- I actually, like I was saying, that you can have the meteor shower starting a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the intensity, though, begins as the Earth is coming through this, you know, real heavy path of debris, which is supposed to start tomorrow night. But there will be meteors even afterwards as well for a few days. So. Okay, so like you can go anywhere from now until you think you said the 17th, was yeah. that? Yeah. Exactly. The, the, the dates for the Geminid shower are usually from about December 4th when you'll first start seeing a few, but they really start picking up towards the 13th and 14th. That's pretty regular as far as that's concerned. Now what happens is sometimes we have a bright moon or whatever that gets in the way of things, or what happens more uh importantly, is that we aren't facing the right direction when the earth goes through the thickest part of the stream. And this year, that combination of things is working out pretty good for us. I think the the center of the stream, as we've defined it, uh, turns out to be about seven o'clock in the evening, our time on Sunday. So we're only a few hours past what would have been the total peak for it. So Europe at this point gets it even slightly better than we do, but it's still pretty good. Another question we have is how far outside of Winnipeg should people go to get some really good um, dark skies? So they're, how far out to avoid the light pollution? Um, what's a good area, you know, how far outside of Winnipeg? Um, Other than Spruce Woods Provincial Park, which has the best dark sky. Right, of course, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if, if you just went out as far as let's say Oak Hammock, just, you know, outside the perimeter, maybe, you know, five, 10 miles past the perimeter, especially depending if you know which directions that you want to look at. For instance, if you wanted to catch the later uh, ones, you might uh, feel okay going, let's say, east of Winnipeg or south of Winnipeg. And, and it's a preference thing for what's convenient for you too, but you don't need to go that far out of Winnipeg to get relatively decent skies, providing that, you know, there's no clouds to reflect uh, uh, the horrid light from Winnipeg. Turn your lights out. <laughs> I'm, nor- um, I'm north of Winnipeg, so I'm always shaking my fist and cursing uh, Winnipeg all the time for the light dome that it's produced. What about Bird's Hill? Could they, people just even have right. Bird's Hill? Wonderful. Perfect. Find a good dark area and go there where there's no lights on, right? <laughs> Um, so we have a couple more. Um, has Patheon been changing shape over time with all of the melting and losing debris? Almost certainly. A matter of fact, I said it wrong. <laughs> yeah, Peyton. Uh, <laughs> it's and actually, Phaeton's based on an old uh, Greek myth, so you can actually read about the the origins of the the name of this. Uh, Thing, and it's kind of got something neatly in common with us. In the old Greek myth, uh, Phaeton was the son of Apollo, and he stole his dad's car. Well, actually, he took the chariot that Apollo used to drive across the sky each day with the sun, and Phaeton uh, got control of the chariot one day and almost burned up the earth. So, <laughs> so to, 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 to spoil the punchline, yeah. Kids, <laughs> anyways... So- so has it been changing over time with it melting and losing debris? Yes, it, it almost certainly has. And matter of fact, as Sylvia was mentioning earlier there, the idea of it having so much material in these orbits suggested it might have broken off of a larger body. We may just be seeing, you know, some of the remains of what was once a much larger body. After a few million years of getting baked around the sun like that, you're going to shrivel up quite a bit. Okay. Um, next question was, will the Saturn and Jupiter alignment be like an eclipse? No, it's just more of two bright stars getting closer and closer together until they look like an even brighter star. If you have binoculars, take a look at it with binoculars because you'll still be able to see the two of them separated. And if you have a telescope, it's a real treat because you can crank up the power on your telescope and you will see both Jupiter and Saturn in the same field of view, which is something that's almost, well, it'll be the only time in your lifetime you'll see that. Okay, um, there was, somebody was asking about which apps to use. I know for myself, I really like to use Skyview, Stellarium and Starwalk for apps on my phone to do some stargazing. 
Do you guys mm -hmm. need any other apps on your phone that you could use for a, a newbie trying to learn how to stargaze and identify what's in the night sky? Yeah, and actually mine's called Sky Portal, but it uses Stellarium as well. So it's a combination of that. It comes from Celestron and it's really, really nice. And you can really find out, you know, when you're wondering, oh, what is that star that's right there? Sky Portal from Celestron is the one that I use. But like you said, Stellarium is quite good too. Did yeah. I'm a bit of a techno peasant when it comes to that. So I don't use too much in the way of apps at all. I went and learned the sky instead, but that's... You use the starry night. I do use Starry oh, Night to, to help uh, with predictions of, of, of such as well. And it's, it's quite powerful. It's a bit finicky, but it really can do the job. If you're really into uh, plotting exact positions of some of these moving objects, there's a wonderful uh, Canadian-based uh, program called Earth-Centered Universe, ECU that will probably give you the most accurate of, uh, of the, what we call the two line elements, the actual mathematical descriptions of the orbits. ECU will probably give it to you better than most of the others will. Okay. Um, Trevor mentions that there's five meter showers actually happening right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, right, they're minor showers for the rest of them. And yeah, there's, there's like I said, I think they're up to about 600 or 700 minor showers for the year now. And keeping track of them all will, will drive you nuts. <laughs> but it's important for you when you're out uh, observing meteors to note that not all the meteors you're gonna see are gonna be from the shower. You might see one coming from a totally different direction. In the average hour, you should see one or two that are going to come from some totally different direction at this point. So those won't be part of the shower. Those are just the regular uh, meteors that you'll see in any given night. And some of those are easy to detect, right? Because you have the radiant coming this way. And if you have a meteor coming from the other way, yeah. cutting across, then that's how you would know, oh, that wasn't a Gemini. That was some sporadic, as they call it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> For instance, Actually, one, uh, one more thing about that. Uh, for instance, when people are watching the Perseid meteor shower, they always think, wow, this is a really great shower. It peaks on August 11th, and, but it's a very broad shower. In other words, you can start watching Perseids two weeks before and a week at least afterwards, and you'll still get a chance of seeing a few good Perseids. But at the same time, the Delta Aquarids, which peaked on the very end of July, are also still going along. So you'll be seeing Delta Aquarids happening then. And there's lots of overlaps when you start to talk about some of the more minor showers that are going on. We have a observation that goes on in October where we are watching meteors come from at least three or four different directions. Awesome, okay, so I have two last questions here. Um, Brent says, on two separate occasions, I've seen a very bright light, uh, bright flash that lit up the night sky, but from a very small point, the size of a star, no trail. It was so fast, it was like a camera flash. Any idea what that may have been, a meteor? Um, at least two possibilities. One is that what you saw was uh, like a iridium flash. Iridium were a particular kind of satellite that had a very broad, shiny mirror-like panel on it. And when it would uh, go over top of you at the right angle, it would reflect the sun at you and it would be so bright, it would light up your place like it was daytime. Now those satellites have almost all disappeared now, but the ones that are still up there, some of them have lost their stability. So they'll flash that light at you even faster than a normal iridium. A normal iridium would flash you in maybe five seconds. But the uh, an iridium that's out of control or several other satellites have the same issues. They could flash you that way. The alternate explanation for what he saw was that me, he may have seen a meteor coming straight at him, in which case he should have ducked. I mean, the, the chances are, of course, that it would have burned up before it got anywhere near him. I mean, most of these things don't get anywhere near us, but take a catcher's mitt with him next time. <laughs> Does air temperature, this question is from Kathy, 
Does air temperature affect viewing? For example, does colder air temperature make for clearer sightings? Not in my case, because I wear glasses and I get fogged up. But uh, the, as far as the question is concerned, uh, we do get a lot of more transparent skies, which is better for watching meteors. It's worse for looking at planets though, because cold temperatures usually make for more unstable skies, which means the seeing, the stability of the air is not as good. So yeah, colder air usually means less humidity, which means more transparency, which means you can see fainter meteors. There you go. I learned something new. Well, I learned lots new tonight, but <laughs> all right. That's the last of the questions that I had in my Q&A. Um, if anybody has any further questions, you can always um, send an email. Uh, Sylvia, did you mention that you were going to post an, an, a link to an email or just go to the winnipeg.rask.ca? Yeah. Actually, when you go into the Winnipeg RASP, there's a contact button, so you can just communicate right through there. And there was one more thing, actually. Our vice president just sent me a quick message to remind me that we have a telescope giveaway. So if you want to participate in this, log into this Winnipeg uh, dot rasc.ca for a chance to get a telescope. Ooh, so yes, everybody make sure you do that. Yeah, you don't have to be a member. Just what? Well, there you go, everyone. Make sure you check into the winnipeg.rask.ca. So I'd like to thank you, Sylvia and Jerry, so much for joining us today. And we really appreciate the time that you took to share with us your knowledge on the meteor shower. And if anybody at home would like to enjoy being the Geminids, I encourage you to head out to your local provincial park or even your own backyard. Uh, make sure you keep your eyes peeled because um, as we have learned today, that is the best way to view the showers. Um, and winter is a wonderful time to go stargazing because it gets so dark so fast, leaving mm -hmm. light and for us to view the stars above. Um, just a reminder that you can download various stargazing apps on your smartphone or tablet like Skyview, Stellarium, Starwalk, and uh, Sylvia, yours was called? Uh, Sky Portal. Sky Portal. Yeah. And just make sure that when you do come out to visit provincial parks that you are following COVID-19 public health orders, make sure you're only visiting with members of your household. And if you do meet up with a friend, you must keep your group to less than five people and practice the fundamentals of physical distancing and wearing a mask. Thank you guys all so much for joining us today and be sure to sign up for our other webinars and online events. The next one is the Christmas Bird Count for Kids. And this is coming up on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. And details and registration info is available on our Manitoba Parks Facebook page or online at manitobaparks.com. So take care and stay safe at home. And thank you, Sylvia and Jerry, so much. This has been wonderful. Well, thank you for hosting us. It's been great. We'll do this yes. again. And thank you all attendees for coming and uh, joining us today. We uh, appreciate you guys all coming.